what I'm going to do in this video is cover this actual context point, which is the first context point of the maintaining balance module. What I'll do in a second, I'll cover the content and the verbs of each of these dot points, which are covered in these 12 videos. And you can see, if you want to just follow the links, you can directly jump to any of these sections. The first one covers enzymes, the second one covers the enzyme activity experiment, the third one covers homeostasis, the fourth one covers endotherms and ectotherms, and the fifth one covers temperature regulation in plants. Otherwise, you can just follow me and I'll go for each of these step by step. First dot point says identify the role of enzymes in metabolism, describe their chemical composition, and use a simple model to describe their specificity on substrates. There's three verbs, so I'll go for each of them separately. So the first one is identify, which means name or recognize the role of enzymes in metabolism. Metabolism is just the idea of that basically all these chemical reactions that occur in our body, all of them together are called our metabolism. So we have lots of basically a thousand different types of chemical reactions, and each of them is really important for our body to function properly. For example, cellular respiration was the idea where we have glucose and oxygen combined to form ATP, that's energy, and we need that energy to be able to perform our normal functions. And without enzymes, those actual chemical reactions wouldn't be going fast enough for us to be able to get enough energy to survive, because enzymes work as biological catalysts, so their role in metabolism is to increase the speed of those chemical reactions to make sure we can survive and have perform our normal bodily functions. The second part was described as a verb, so that means provide characteristics and features of the chemical composition of enzymes. So the chemical composition just means what kind of chemicals these enzymes are made up of. And enzymes are proteins, that's really important to know. And so this is an example of an enzyme, just a protein. But you should also know more because it's described, so you need to know the characteristics. So proteins are made up of a chain of amino acids each of these will be an amino acid, and they'd be hooked on together to form a polypeptide chain. There could be more than thousands of amino acids long. And then they fold it to basically each of these different colors are meant to be a different chain. They just all come together and they fold together to make a protein, and you get this kind of shape at the end. Right? So that's the actual chemical composition. And the next one was described as a verb. So it says use a simple model to provide characteristics and features that was described of their specificity on substrates. So we need to use a model, and we're going to use a lock and key model. And the idea here is that we have a specificity, which means we have lactase enzyme, is an example of an enzyme. It works only on the lactose substrate. The substrate is the thing that's going to be broken down, so we have it being specific towards that actual substrate. So only lactose, lactose works on lactase because it can only bind to the active site. The active site is specific for the actual substrate. And once they hook on, if it's a lock and key model, that means it's going to be a perfect fit. It's going to fit onto it perfectly. And then it's going to break it apart. And that's its function, that's what the enzyme does, it breaks it apart faster. And then we have the products forming, and the products are what comes out of the actual reaction. In this case, it's glucose and galactose. These two points are all related to the enzyme activity experiment. The first one we're going to cover is the actual experiment itself, and it says test the verbs, so test the effect of increased temperature, change in pH, and change in substrate concentration on the activity of a named enzyme. And you also need to know your first investigation verbs for this one. So the actual named enzyme I will be using is renin, which is the enzyme. The chemical reaction is as follows. We've got liquid milk as our substrate. And if our enzyme is working, that substrate will be broken down into products. And the product will be the clumpy milk. Basically, the protein in the milk will turn from liquid into clumpy. Now, we have a setup of six test tubes. We have three of them being our controls. So we have three of them only having substrates, which means we don't expect much to happen because we don't have any enzymes in those actual test tubes. Whereas the other three will have the enzyme plus the substrate, so these will be the ones we expect something to maybe change. And we also have different dependent variables and independent variables. No point says plants need to be able to change dependent and independent variables. Dependent and variable is something that we measure. In this case, we measure the enzyme activity, so we're seeing how long it takes for these different uh, test tubes to go clumpy, that's what we're measuring. The independent variable is what we change. So for example, if we're measuring temperature, we're going to change the actual temperature. If we're measuring pH, we're going to change the pH. If we're measuring substrate concentration, we're going to change the substrate concentration. The control variables are things that we keep the same. With the temperature one, for example, we keep the pH and the concentration the same, but we change the actual temperature, whereas with the pH, we change the pH, but keep the other two the same, and the same with substrate concentration. We would keep the um, pH and the temperature the same, but change the concentration. Right? So we should know the dependent, independent, and control variables. Control is what we keep the same. Independent is what we're changing. Dependent is what we're measuring. And you also should be ready or to design your own experiment, because plan also means you need to design, design your own experiment. And in terms of the, it says also says identify data sources. That means you need to know what type of data we collect and how do we analyze it. So remember, we're collecting the actual time it takes for these different 
test tubes to go clumpy, milk to go clumpy. And how do we analyze it? The longer it takes, the, that means the, the less activity the enzyme. So the faster this goes clumpy, the more the enzyme will be active. So with the actual experiment, for example, the temperature one, you would have actually seen not much change in the ones that are the control because there's no enzyme in there. Whereas you would exp most of the clumpiness would have occurred in the one at about 30 degrees Celsius. Whereas it might be a bit of clumpiness in the one with 10 degrees and a bit of clumpiness with 50 degrees Celsius. These are the temperatures you had and the graph you would have produced would have been something similar to this. And that shows you that you have your opt optimum temperature at about 30-ish degrees Celsius. And if you have, if you go on either side of that, the enzymes become denatured, which means they less, they work less effectively. Right? You've done the same experiment with your pH, and you would have found that the ideal pH would be roughly at seven, and at three pH and ten pH they work less well, which means that you have a similar graph to the one when it comes to um, temperature. You have the optimum pH, and on either side of that, it will become less efficient because of the denaturing of the enzyme. And the renin, when you had substrate concentration being changed, so for example, one you had five, the other you had ten, you had the other one you had twenty. What you found as well, in terms of results, is that when you had five percent changed to ten percent, there was more activity, more clumpiness. But then, if you had twenty percent, there at some point it just plateaued, because basically the enzymes were so being so overused that any increase in the concentration didn't have an effect on the actual enzyme activity anymore, because they were all being used. So that was the overall the idea of the experiment. And you should also know the procedure, so the step-by-step -step procedure in terms of how you did this experiment. And you should know the safety concerns. So for example, you use heating elements to um, decrease the temperature or increase the temperature. You might have hurt yourself with those heating elements. You might have used acid when it comes to the pH, change of the pH, and that could be problematic as well. And you should also know some safety precautions you could do to minimize the risk. Right. Because of these verbs, perform, choose equipment, identify data sources, and plan, you need to know quite a bit of detail about this experiment. And also, what I'm also going to cover is the second one, which is identify, which means name and recognize. The pH is a way of describing the city of the substance. So in this case, what pH is, a pH of 7 it just means neutral. If it has less than 7, that means acidic. So in this case, anything below 7 um, is acidic, and anything above 7 would be basic. But that's basically the extent to what you need to know from that top point. And the last one was explain why the constant maintenance of a constant internal environment is important for metabolic activity or efficiency. And, sh and explain and show why. So metabolic efficiency is how well your enzymes work. And we just talked about if you have, let's say, a temperature not being ideal. So if you don't keep that constant internal environment at, let's say, 37 or 38 degrees, that means our enzymes become denatured. Their metabolic activity will go down. Efficiency will go down because it becomes denatured. And that means we have... A problem in our body. We have problems with our chemical reactions. Uh, this is about homeostasis. The first open says describe homeostasis, which just means provide features and characteristics of homeostasis, the process by which organisms maintain a relatively stable internal environment. Remember, we want to keep our internal environment relatively stable. So, for example, we want to keep our temperature at 37 degrees Celsius to make sure enzymes work. We need to have some kind of mechanisms that can detect change if it goes too high or if it goes too low. So, we want to detect the stimulus and then bring it back down to make sure that it stays at 37 degrees Celsius. And that's what homeostasis basically is. So just describe some of those features. The next one was explain, which means show that. Homeostasis consists of two stages, detection and counteracting of change. And also I'm going to cover the third one as well, which is outline. So it means sketch in general terms, the role of the nervous system in detecting and responding to environmental change. So if we have that 37 degrees Celsius our set point, if we have a stimulus, which means either a decrease or an increase of that temperature, what's going to happen is we're going to have thermoreceptors picking up the change, these thermoceptors pick up the change, then those the signals going to get sent on to the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus will do will decide what to do in terms of sending a signal to onto effectors. The effectors are the ones which will make the response happen. If the temperature is too high, these effectors will be the sweat gland and the blood vessels, and these blood vessels will produce a response. That so the sweat glands will produce sweat and the blood vessels will dilate, and both these responses basically counteract the change. The change was an increase, and these responses will bring it back to normal, so they've counteract that change. Same thing happens if it's too low, hypothalamus in this case decide to send a signal to the actual effectors, such as the muscles and the blood vessels. Those will start shivering in case of muscles, and the blood vessels will start constricting. And both these are mechanisms to bring our temperature back up, so thereby having counteract that change in terms of a decrease in temperature. Right? So this was the idea of how it works, and we also want to make sure we know about the nervous system. The nervous system 
is, for example, the thermal receptors are part of the nervous system, so are the hypothalamus, and so are all these neurons that connect the receptors of the hypothalamus and the sweat glands. So basically, detection and response can't occur without the actual neurons and the, the actual nervous system itself. So that's why it's really important. In terms of develop a model to make a feedback mechanism, so we need to be able to make our own model, and the model we can use is the aircon. The aircon works quite similar. For example, if we want to have 18 degrees Celsius in our, in our room, the actual aircon will blow more cold air if the temperature increases to bring it back down again. Right? And it will stop blowing cold air if the temperature's gone too low to also help it bring it back to 18 degrees Celsius. So the aircon works in a quite similar fashion to how thermal regulation works in our body. I'm going to cover the next top point. The first one says identify, which means name or recognize the broad range of temperatures over which life is found compared with the narrow limits for individual species. So what we should first of all realize is life can be found in different types of temperatures, for example in ice, in the human body, and the hot springs. At ice you'd have a temperature of around 0 degrees, the body would be at 37, and in the hot springs might be 7 degrees Celsius. And if life can be found in those living areas, that means you can find enzymes there as well. So in each of these enzy enzymes would have a different type of optimum temperature which means, yes, we can find different types of enzymes, but if we, for example, take the one which comes from the actual uh, hot springs and put them into the human environment or the other way around, then that same enzyme will become denatured and won't work properly. So we have a huge spectrum of different types of enzymes. They all work in a specific type of environment. That's what that means. You take them out of it and they die. Uh, the next part was compare, which means show how responses are different or similar of a named ectothermic and endothermic organism to changes in the ambient temperature. The second part of that top point was explain how, which means show how these responses assist in temperature regulation. So we need to compare them, and then we need to say how each of the responses helps as well. So for example, the wrecking group, that's an example of an endotherm. Endo means inside, therm means temperature. So it can regulate its internal temperature by itself. It has mechanisms to do so. Whereas blue tongue lizard is an example of an ectotherm. Ecto means outside, so that means it cannot regulate its internal temperature. Whatever the outside temperature is, is also the inside temperature. So it needs to use the environment to control its actual temperature. Now we need to talk about when for the wrecking group, when it's too hot and when it's too cold, and what it actually does in both those situations and why it does it. So for example, the wrecking group will lick its paws. The reason why is because there's going to be more evaporation of, a of sweat or of saliva happening on the paws. That means we've got more cooling below the actual skin, so we've got the temperature will go down because of the leaking of the paws. And also, it can seek shade because it will find an area where it's less heat. That means it can try to not heat up as much. So that's also good when it's too hot. Whereas when it's too cold, what it will do, it will hop around. And it'll do so because muscle will then produce more heat, which will basically um, bring the temperature back up. So it's good when it's too cold. And also, it can constrict these blood vessels. That makes sure there's less heat loss to the arms and legs. And overall less heat lost, which means it can it's good to conserve heat, which is useful when it's too cold. Whereas compare that to the actual blue tongue lizard, it's gonna do something called controlled exposure, which means it's only gonna show parts of its body. That means it's gonna only show less surface area to the sun, which means it's good when it's too hot, as that will basically just help it to control its temperature for using controlled exposure. And also, it can seek shade, and again, same idea with the actual red kangaroo. Seeking shade is just going to be in a less warm environment, and that means it's going to have its ability to control its actual temperature for this internal regulation. And it's also going to be able to sit on hot rock if it's too cold. That's useful for being able to transfer heat from the rock to the actual looting lizard. And it's going to be useful to be able to bring that temperature back up. And uncurl the tail, that means there's going to be more surface area being exposed, which means the sun is going to basically heat up a bigger area, which means that's useful when it's too cold because that will increase the temperature. But that was just some of the actual different types of compares. The last top points are these ones. The first one says identify, which means name or recognize some response of plants to temperature change. So you need to know for hot conditions and cold conditions, you need to know plant responses to those conditions. So for example, when it gets really hot, the ball brush releases seeds after bushfires, for example. Eucalyptus tree will actually drop some of the leaves doing really, really hot, um, hot conditions to basically reduce surface area, which means less hotting up occurs. During cold conditions, we have got the decades trees. What they do is they actually lose their leaves because there's little sun during actual um, cold conditions, which means there's no point in having these leaves. So by doing so, they, they save some energy, and that is good for survival. So it's basically like hibernation for the actual tree. And also during cold conditions, there's something called delayed seed germination. Many European plants do this, and they will not germinate 
until they're exposed to warmer conditions because they wouldn't be able to grow in those cold conditions. And then the next one is describe, which means provide characteristics and features of adaptations and responses to that have occurred in Australian organisms to assist in temperature regulation. So one, for example, that comes to the plants, the eucalyptus tree has a response, such as having vertically hanging leaves. These vertically hanging leaves allow it to be able to assist in temperature regulation, because that means only part of the actual tree will plant will be exposed to sunlight, which means less of, less of it is warmed up overall. And an adaptation of the eucalyptus tree would be, for example, that it has a narrower leaf, and that means there's less surface area compared to, for example, some European leaves. The less surface area means there's less sun heat that heats up that whole leaf, and that's good for hot climates as well, right? So these would be some adaptation responses of Australian plants, eucalyptus tree. I should also know one example of an Australian endotherm and ectotherm, so it could be, for example, the red kangaroo and the blue king lizard. But this was a quick summary of the dot points for the first context point. I hope that was useful.